All right, Creek Stewart, welcome back to the show. Hey, man, it's good to be back. It's great to great to be here with you. So it's been a while. The last time we had you on the podcast is back in 2013. But if people have been following the art of manliness for a long time, they know you. You're the wilderness survival guy, the prepper guy. You've written some classics for AOM in the past. We got the zombie apocalypse survival shotgun. <laughs> We've got the, your camouflaging articles, article on how to use a tampon in a survival situation. And I, I think a lot of people know your work that you've done like with the Weather Channel, with fat guys in the woods and things like that. And I wanted to bring you on because right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and this is the thing that you're helping people get ready for. And you, I love in your emails, you always end with a motto. It's not if, but when. So I, I think, I imagine before the pandemic, I think there's plenty of people who thought of, you know, prepper survival type people was being, being too paranoid. Do you think people are changing their tune now about this? You know, this, this particular a disaster, tragedy, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, is super interesting. I've I've found over the years of studying survival stories and taking people into the woods and 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 just studying these things and being really in this industry that really the the catalyst for a change of mind or a change of behavior or habit it I found that it really comes from one of two things, either extreme suffering or extreme tragedy. And in this particular pandemic, in this particular scenario, there there is definitely a tragic side to it. I mean, there are absolutely people whose health are affected and there are people dying. And I don't want to be insensitive toward that at all whatsoever. And I know that in the midst of all of this, people are being laid off work and the economy's changing and losing their jobs. So there is absolutely a tragic side to this. But the interesting part of this pandemic is that in general, most people's needs are being met. You know, they still have food and water and electricity and access to medical care and heat and their furnace works and their toilets work and their showers work. And so on that side of things, there's not a lot of suffering happening. And so I think while this is really bringing the idea of preparedness to mind in the midst of this and staying home and being quarantined, I think that because there is real no, is is not really it, what what you would consider traditional disaster suffering because that isn't happening in this particular scenario i would i would guess that that a lot of people will be very quick to forget about the quarantine and the coronavirus a few weeks after this whole thing passes and so do do I do I think that that there'll be a change of tune as far as I think for some people but I think for a lot of people time time really will take away the details and and we'll be back and we'll be back to square one uh, when the next one happens so I hope that's not the case but my guess is that you know this will be a this will be a small hiccup for a lot of people and I don't know that you know that it will be the wake up call that I wish it would be yeah, humans, we always forget. And that's how that's why we, we repeat history oftentimes. Yeah. So your your focus with your work is a lot about prepping you know, surviving away from your primary residence, either surviving in the wild or bugging out to another location. Well, that's another article you've written for us, you know, how to build a bug out bag. Yeah. But you've also written about what's called bugging in, which is appropriate with this quarantining and social distancing and shelter in place that's been going on. For those who aren't familiar with the idea, what is bugging in? Well, bugging in is, I guess, I guess the best way to describe it is another phrase for the, the idea of sheltering in place. And sheltering in place, the concept has been around for a really long time. And so with a bu bugging out, you're, you're leaving your primary place of re residence for somewhere that's more safe. It's just not safe to stay at home. And so you have to leave in order to be safe. Well, bugging in is the exact opposite. Either you're, you're staying in to be safe or you have no option to leave or you're basically forced at home. And so there are a lot of different things that could cause a bug-in scenario. Historically, they've been 
chemical related, biological related, radiological, even nuclear. Um, all of those are, are I, I guess you, they're real common. I mean, not common, but those would be kind of the classic reasons to, to bug in. Um, some other ones that have happened in a little bit more recent history have been violence. You know, violence is often a reason for local governments to, um, you know, to put out an ordinance to stay shelter in place. Like during the Boston Marathon, for example, the local police department did encouraged sheltering at place because of the bombings. And in Los Angeles in 2016, there was there. I remember there was a a sulfuric acid tanker that caught on fire. And so everyone within 15 miles or so of that tanker were required to shelter in place for safety. The most common, I would say, though, is winter storm warnings, winter storms that cause people to have to shelter in place or bug in. You know, but now we're seeing, you know, globally, you know, this this pandemic with the, with the COVID-19 epidemic and, so, you know, something certainly that's never happened in my lifetime. So whenever you're consulting people on how to bug in, like in general, how long do you advise people to prepare to be hunkered down for? Well, I base that on three tiers and it's a little bit different for everyone and based upon everyone's time, budget, and how serious they are. Uh, uh, two weeks is an absolute minimum these days. Used to, it was three days. I can remember it was, you know, having three days worth of supplies on hand, almost kind of like a bug out bag. But these days, it's absolutely a minimum of two weeks to be able to bug in and be completely independent of survival on all of your needs for two weeks. Myself and what I would encourage other people to do is have a three-tiered plan. It starts with two weeks, which is pretty easy to accomplish for most people, even on a tight budget. And then a three-month plan, which is a little bit more complicated, but still fairly easy to accomplish for most people. And then stretch it out a little bit further and have a one-year plan, which for most is going to be feel really extreme and may sound a little bit crazy. But for myself, I have a two-week, a three-month, and a one-year plan for complete independent survival for me and my family. Gotcha. And I mean, I think with this, it's it's good to have all those different tiers because you never know what the situation is going to be like. Right now, during this current pandemic, we had this you know immediate burst of people going out and just stockpiling stuff. So there's nothing there. Yeah. Or there's still stuff there, but it's not great. So it's in that situation, it'd be nice to have that two-week buffer then. But you never know if that if the supply chain, for whatever reason, doesn't kick into action like it should, that one month might come in handy then. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every disaster is totally different. And one, one minor change in this particular one with uh, the coronavirus, if we just took out, you know, if we took the coronavirus as it is right now, where people are quarantined at home and, you know, everybody's forced to stay at home and just for their own health and safety. But if you just take out one other thing, ev- right now, everything is accessible. Everyone has electric, their furnaces are working, their water's running, they have access to food and medicine, they have internet and cell phone service. But if you remove just one of those services, things become exponentially more complicated. I mean, you take out electric, and it's it, ever and we're having a totally different conversation <laughs> you know like i mean you take out water and this thing becomes so more dangerous and so more complicated just one of those services missing and this is an entirely different conversation so when you're thinking about bugging in what are the categories uh, for human survival that you should be thinking about when you bug in and is there anything in particular that you should think about when it comes to pandemics well, that's a really good question. When when I think about survival and bugging in, like when I really sat down and started developing my own bug in plan, I thought about my grandpa. I thought about, okay, when my grandpa was my age, what did he need? And that was, you know, back when my, you know, back when my grandpa was my age and younger, he needed water. He needed food. He needed a way to cook that food. He needed a way to stay warm in the winter. He needed 
personal hygiene items to a certain degree and some limited medication type situ and first aid tools. And then he needed all the like supplies and tools that related to any of those categories. For example, for he needed a way to heat his home in, in the winter. Well, he needed a way to cut firewood and split firewood and he needed a fireplace. And so when it comes to bugging in, it's oftentimes really over overworked and made to be more complicated than it needs to be because we live in a day and age when we forget that it wasn't that long ago that times were a lot simpler, that there was no running water, there was no electric, there were no indoor bathrooms, and there was no you know, internet and all that stuff. And when you really break it down, it's water, food, a way to cook the food, a way to heat your home if you live in a cold environment, some first aid and personal hygiene items, and then the tools that go with any one of those categories. Gotcha. So let's dig into some of these categories in more detail. Yeah. So you mentioned water. And I think it's interesting for the, I, I talked to you about this before we started recording. And for the past three weeks on Art of Manliness, a couple years ago, I'm going to say six years ago, I wrote this article on you know, how to do long-term water storage. And then for the past three weeks, you can just see it in our analytics, like the search traffic to that article has been been going up. So it's it's a concern for people that you know somehow the water is going to go away. But as you said, this it's interesting, this emergency that we're dealing with, water's still there. But again, it could might not be there. And even let's say there's another disaster of some sort where your water shut off. Let's talk about water supply. How much water do you think a person needs in their home to last that two weeks, for example? Well, the general rule of thumb is one gallon per day per person. That's for not only draking, but also personal hygiene and and washing and bathing. And so one gallon per person per day indefinitely, you know, for as long as whatever your plan is, is the amount of water that you'll need. And you're right about water. I mean, water gets knocked offline all the time. I mean, just in my hometown last week, in the midst of this pandemic, there was a boil issue in the hometown that I grew up in. There was a um, there was a boil warning where, because of some pumps went down or something like that, and you know it happens all the time. Not too long ago in Flint, Michigan, there there were major water issues where there were boil where there were boil warnings. And, you know, places like Southern California that don't have their in their own independent water supply, you know, it, it becomes a very fragile situation. And water is our most basic of human survival needs. I would, I would say outside of an immediate first aid threat, water is at the top. So, uh, okay, one gallon a day. Let's say you want to, you know, store two, you know, two weeks worth or a month worth. Like, how do you store, what are the best way to store water, different options for that. Yeah. So for, I'll just take my three tier, for example, okay. My two week, my three month and my one year tiers. And that, that I think describing how I do it will, will really, will really help. So my two week tier, I, I have two weeks worth of bottled water on hand at all times. And we move through, my family and I, we move through that on a regular basis. So we're always grabbing a water, bottled water. And so we're kind of moving through that two-week supply of bottled water at any given moment. And beyond two weeks, it starts to get, you start to get into a situation where, okay, I need to think about how do I store this water and how can I depend on it for up to a year? Okay. Bottled water will easily last up to a year, except it's just a little bit cumbersome to, you know, to pack months worth of bottled water in your basement. Okay. So some of the best ways to store water for, let's say up to a three month time period are going to be two ways. Number one is those five gallon, kind of like the water cooler at an office those five gallon water containers. Those are a little cumbersome, but having one of those dispensers in your kitchen and having five gallon containers of those waters downstairs or in the basement or in the garage, uh, those are a really good way to store a lot of water. 55 gallon drums, food grade drums is what I use for my three month water storage, which can last up to a year. There's a company called Aquamira that makes a really good two-part mixture that you pour into that that makes it that helps keep your water good for up to a year. 
And you can buy 55 gallon drums on Amazon. You can find them on, you know, food grade drums. Probably the easiest places is, is on Amazon. But you can buy a pump so that you can pump water right out of them. And I change out the water in my 55 gallon drums every year. It's a little bit of a hassle, but I normally take one day a year and change out my drums and then refill those back up and put in a two part water purification mixture in there and I'm good for another year. Storing water more than three months, one gallon per person per day becomes a little much. After that, you really start, you really need to start thinking about kind of an independent water supply. And that could either be a rain harvesting system or obviously some type of a well. A really common way to store water that a lot of people use are recycled two liter bottles, not milk jugs because they tend to degrade and get a little weird over time, but two liter bottles or other plastic bottles like juice bottles, those are really great ways to store, to store water. And when you fill up a two liter bottle or a juice jug or something like that, I always put in, when I used to store my water like that, I would put in two drops of bleach, of unscented bleach per liter when I would, when I would do the storage. And, and that, that'll pretty much keep you up for a year. All right. So you've got water stored up. Now you need to think about food. What kind of food should you store for your long-term bug-in situation? I'm going to go back to my whole, my three year, my, my three tier system again. And I think it'll make a lot of sense. So for myself and my family, this is the same model that I would encourage anyone to consider and possibly adapt uh, if, if so inclined. So for myself and my family, we, we keep, you know, there's a, there's a saying within the survival industry that America is nine meals away from anarchy. And what that means is that most people have nine meals worth of food in their home at any given moment. And after that, things start getting a little crazy. And so for myself and my family, we keep two weeks worth of food. We're, we're going to go back to that two week, three month, and one year mark. So I keep two weeks, three months, and one year's worth of food in our house for independent survival for me and my family at any given moment. The two weeks category includes everything that we eat on a regular basis, fresh vegetables, meat, frozen meats, frozen vegetables, canned goods, pastas, you know, anything that's either in a package or ready to cook, ready to open up, ready to prepare. So we keep anywhere between, I don't know, one and two weeks worth of food, three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two weeks. Beyond that, from two weeks, and, and we're constantly moving through that food and buying more groceries or canning more or hunting more. And so we're constantly replenishing that two-week food supply and we're moving on a regular basis through that. Beyond that, from our two-week to three-month window, I have moved to a freeze-dried food methodology. I used to I used to use all kinds of kind of hodgepodge uh, different food storage options, but up until my three month mark, beyond two weeks, if I couldn't get any more food, couldn't hunt, couldn't fish, couldn't go to the grocery store, couldn't get canned goods, then I would depend on freeze dried food. Now it's a little bit more expensive, but it's very simple. It lasts for 25 years. You can you can buy three months worth of this food. You can put it down. You can buy it gradually over time. You don't have to buy it all at once. It is a little expensive, but you can put it down in the basement or in a kind of a, you know, just somewhere that doesn't have sunlight and that's fairly cool, ideally. And you'll last 25 years with that stuff. And it's literally it's freeze dried. So you just add water, heat it up. If it's a, if it's a heat up meal and you're ready to go and it's really, really easy. And the stuff's pretty good. Now beyond three months, freeze dried food gets really expensive. You can buy one year packages of freeze dried food, but they're very in the thousands of dollars. And so beyond that, then we start talking about what my grandpa did. We're back to my grandpa, right? We're back to grains. We're back to maybe producing some of your own foods, hunting, fishing, chickens, backyard chickens, goats, things like that. As far as food storage goes, a lot of grains, you know, barley, corn, flour, rice, a lot of pastas, macaronis, noodles, and spaghettis, and, you know, some, a lot of 
in, it's more of an ingredients list of food storage, a lot of beans and legumes and canned foods and spices and mixes and you know all of those things that you use to actually build and cook meals. And a lot of that stuff lasts a really long time, like wheat and corn and rice and beans. I mean, you if you package those things correctly, those things will easily last you 25 years. And so with the, this ingredient stuff, that not only do you have to cult, you know, you know, store the stuff, but you also have to learn how to cook it in yeah. a way that's palatable. And that's actually the really hard part. Um, the storing the stuff is really simple. You know, we I buy I buy my bulk goods in fifty fifty pound bags, but then I repackage that into into plastic food grade five gallon buckets. So it's it's really easy to storage, and you don't have to worry about mice or anything like that. And but. Th- The catch here is all of a sudden you got to know how to cook like your grandma, you know, you got to know how to make the biscuits and mix the wheat and make the, I mean, and make all the things. And so for a lot of people, including myself, that's a real challenge. And so that's a part of, you know, that's something that I've been working on personally over the years is, you know, once a week or so really, you know, getting getting my hands messy in the kitchen a little bit and really understanding how to cook you know especially my generation or me i'll just take blame for it you know i'm not a cook and i don't spend a lot of time cooking but if you go this route with long term food storage you have to cook because you can't just you can't just eat the beans you know uh so you mentioned freeze dried food what about mres what's your take on those MREs could easily be in that category. That three, I mean, MREs could be in, you know, could be in I, in either your three week, your 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 two month, your I mean, your two week, your three month, or your one year category. They're very, I mean, they're calorie dense. They'll last twenty five years, a lot of them, and uh, they're open and eat. You know, really great long term meals. The only problem is like freeze, freeze dried food. They're they're expensive. You know, those run anywhere. I mean, last time I checked, you know, roughly eight bucks a eight bucks a pop. Right. So you're paying for convenience, basically, with that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But it's a fantastic option. You know. So you mentioned, you know, for water, like ideally you have a gallon a day. Is there some sort of recommendation for how much food you need uh, per person? You know, that's a tough one. You could break. I mean, I've broken mine down based upon testing with meals. The I mean, I've got it into, I could give you my kind of, all right, let me, let me see here. I do, I have written down my, what I have per person in my household and it'd give you at least a rough idea, but these are, but I've got these, the way I've written these down are one year numbers. And so this sounds a little crazy. Like for example, grains, which would include rice, wheat, any seeds for sprouting, oats and corn and barley and things like that. You know, I keep 600 pounds per person per year on hand. I mean, just, and that's just the grains. And then there's all kinds of other categories. We like, I keep, I keep 75 pounds of canned of dried milk on hand per person. And about 35 pounds of oil and fats like peanut butter and powdered margarine and cooking oil for cooking. And, you know, the, the, the numbers for one year sound a little crazy, but the way I would kind of back that down is you have to, in order to, in order to plan for long-term food storage, you have to understand how to cook it. And the only way to understand how to cook it is to actually get in the kitchen and start playing around with these ingredients. And it's only until you do that that you're gonna that you're gonna be able to multiply out how much of these items you're gonna need. There are a lot of rough estimates online, like the LDS Church. They have some fantastic information about long-term food storage that I would recommend anyone read through as a part of just the culture of that church for as long as they've been into existence, they have been in the business of long-term food storage. In fact, their warehouse, they have a something called the storehouse. That's a fantastic place to get long-term food storage grains. 
I buy a lot of mine at, at bulk markets like Gordon Food Services and even online on Amazon. But that LDS Church, their storehouse, if there's one in your area, there are some fantastic buys on long-term food storage, like big bags of grain and rice and stuff like that. And the other thing you got to think about too, with food storage at least, is or even with water storage, you got to know where you're going to keep it. Uh, if you have a, a house with a big garage or basement, not a problem. But if you're in an apartment, then you have to get creative or maybe you won't, won't be able to carry as much. Uh, underneath your bed, that's a place where a lot of people I know put their food storage. They actually, or they actually turn their food storage into like the box springs of their bed. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. You'd be surprised that, you know, if you, what a slew of five gallon buckets could make, you know, you could easily turn that into a coffee table or a bed frame, but uh, there's all kinds of creative ways, but you're right. It's, it, they can, I mean, especially water. And when you start storing up three months worth of water and food, it's absolutely going to take up some space. You know, it could sound, it could seem if, for someone who's just starting to think about, I need, maybe this Corona thing has, has got someone thinking like, listen, this just scared the holy bejesus out of me. And I want to start keeping some food storage on hand for my family. I mean, don't start it one year. You'll never get done. You know, that will become so overwhelming that you'll just quit. I always say for the person who's just starting out, I always say start with a bug out bag. Th that that gets you three days worth of independent survival. And there's always a place for a bug out bag. And then, I mean, there's a fantastic article on your site about building a bug out bag. But there, you know, and then work your way up from that three days. You know, you've got that, throw that in your closet. And now think about my two weeks. And you'd be surprised at how easy it is to get two weeks. And then once you've got two weeks, then you take it a step farther and you think about, okay, what is some food and how do I store a little bit more water? And then let's get me to that one month mark. Okay. But once you get past two weeks, you want to start thinking about food that's going to sit on the shelf for a year. Okay. So that's either freeze dried, that's MREs, or that's dried goods. Like I was just talking about wheat and rice and beans. And then the ingredients to make meals with those things. So anything beyond two weeks, you want, you want to have a long-term shelf life because you don't want to be dealing with that stuff. Ideally, you want a shelf life that's 25 years. And it is totally possible with those three categories of foods to sit them on the shelf for 25 years. Freeze-dried foods, MREs, like you mentioned, and dried goods. Those, are all, those will all last 25 years if stored properly. And it's really easy to get one month's worth of food and water in storage over the course of just a few weeks. It's incredibly easy to do on a very tight budget. This stuff is not – now, the freeze-dried is a little bit expensive, but when you get into dried goods, it is not expensive at all to get, to get an incredible amount of food storage under your belt in dried goods. Awesome. So this is all uh, this is all really practical, actionable advice that you just gave. So let's talk about another item of category of human survival you got to think about when you're bugging in, and that is first aid. So what sort of first aid items should people stock up on for a bug in scenario? If there was one category that I'm weak in, it's probably first aid. That's probably my weakest category of all. And so I always, in my first aid preps, I always multiply out what I need. I know what I need for first aid in the outdoors because I know what those most common injuries are from experience. And so when I think about first aid, I think about it a little bit differently than most. You know, most people would say, I need a little first aid kit and I need to beef up on band aids and neosporin and things like that. Well, I'm of the mindset that. You know, that stuff is fine for first aid, but what you really need for first aid are the things to deal with real first aid emergencies. And those are not things that can be fixed with a band aid and neosporin and a, and a little butterfly patch and a patch of gauze. And so when I think about first aid, I think about what are the big things that can happen that can really, you know, that can really knock someone out. And those things are major bleeding. And so we need things to control major bleeding if someone gets cut or falls on something or something weird happens. And the, the four things that I would recommend to start off your, your bleeding control kit, if we're going to call it that, is a tourniquet. And I use a cat tourniquet, a combat application tourniquet. 
I use a product, I pack a product in all of my first aid kits and my bug in kit called Sealox Z Fold Gauze, which is it's a it's a wound packing. It helps your blood clot. And it's kind of an anti kind of a clotting agent mixed in with that gauze. So you can pack it and it'll just seal up a wound pretty good. An Israeli compression bandage goes a long way, a handful of those, and then some ace wrap so that you can really wrap that stuff up tight. And ace wrap can be used for all kinds of things. But you definitely need a system in place for bleeding control because a Band-Aid and a little bit of gauze just ain't going to cut it. But I know uh, on the, the bleeding control, I know ITS Tactical, they sell some kits where like all everything you need for that as well. Just it's fantastic like, it's like a pouch. It's got a tourniquet and everything and the gauze. So yeah, that's another place. If you just want everything all in one place, ITS Tactical has that stuff. Yeah, and they, and they'll probably have everything that I've just mentioned in that kit and and some other and some other items as well. You know, a company like ITS, they're gonna ha- they're gonna put together a fantastic bleeding control kit. I'm sure. So what else besides bleeding control? Okay, so then we're moving to sprains and broken or fractured bones. That's something that can really knock someone out. And so everyone should have a SAM splint or four in their kit. A SAM splint can literally be used to stabilize. I think every single bone in the human body. You can cut it and you can you can splint a finger with it. You can use it to splint your leg and your arm and you could stabilize your head and your neck. You can do all kinds of things with a SAM splint. And so a couple of those on hand and some ACE wrap bandage and you should be pretty go pretty good to go and some medical tape. You should be pretty good to go to sta- help stabilize any sprains or and broken bones to at least temporarily. Because that's a category that absolutely happens. And so another one is burns. A lot of people don't think about burns, but man, when when you get a burn, things can go downhill really quick if you don't take care of it. And one of the products I like best for burns is a product called Water Gel. Um, Water J-E-L. And they come in individual packets and it's just an outstanding burn dressing. And it's one that a lot of outdoor enthusiasts use and it can it could just as easily be used inside. So uh, another thing that people need to think about too, what I think this uh, the coronavirus pandemic has brought to light with supply chain is if you have any underlying health issues, like perhaps store up on medication as much as you can for you know the medicines that you're taking right now, because that might not you might not have it when you need it. Yeah, ab- no, absolutely. I mean, if something happened, which absolutely could, that interrupted the the supply chain for medicine or prevented people from being able to go to the pharmacy or something like that, I mean, we're talking worst case scenario. And so I think most doctors these days totally understand a very simple conversation like this. Hey, doc, I'm putting together an emergency kit in my house. I want to be ready just in case that I can't get my meds for up to three months. Can you help me get a back supply of medicine that I could keep on hand for a three month supply? And if your doctor, you know, isn't willing to work with you to get that done, especially in this day and age, then I would say go find a different doctor. Uh, Because people who are medically dependent on medicine, you absolutely need to have a backup supply of that stuff on hand. And I think now with coronavirus, having that conversation with your physician makes a lot more sense. You could say, listen, I mean, I just went through the scare of my life and I was scared to death that I wasn't going to be able to get my medicine. And I knew, I know now that I need a backup supply on hand. Can you help me? Can we put together a plan where I can at least put some back just in case. And and besides stocking up on medicines and supplies for first aid, another part of this is getting the skills training, because if you have all the stuff, but don't know how to use it, then it's pretty much worthless. Absolutely. I mean, being able to, you know, even put on a tourniquet, you know, understanding, I mean, you can have all the tourniquets in the world, but if you don't know how to use it properly, it's never going to work. It'd probably be more dangerous than, you know, not using one at all. But all of this stuff absolutely requires at least a little bit of training. The good news is, is that it's not something that is that you need to spend full time. I mean, this this can become a really fun hobby. You know, getting getting your preps ready for your family. You know, there's nothing more important that you can do for your family. You know, a lot of people go to work every day to put food on the table for their family. It's the same thing. You know, you're just you're just prepping for your family or for yourself in a different way. You know, it's a different kind of life insurance policy, and 
you know, these are fantastic things to do as a family, to, you know, to train as a family on the evenings and weekends. And it can, it can be a lot of fun too. Well, and if you're shelter in place, you've got, you, you can't go anywhere. So this is something to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's an entirely new, that's an entirely category that a lot of people overlook is, you know, just remaining sane during a bug in scenario. Cause there's a lot of funny stuff going around like right now, just online about people spending just an inordinate amount of time with their families all day long with their kids and, you know, going crazy. But you know, there's something to be said for that, you know, keeping, you know, thinking about what if I could, I literally couldn't leave the house. I mean, right now people can go out into their yards and, go outside and take a walk and go to the grocery stores. But what if you were really cooped up in your house? There are actually situations that could call for that, you know, that aren't off the table in our future. What if you couldn't leave your house? You know, can you keep yourselves entertained for a couple of weeks or for a week? And those things should be included in your list too. You know, whether it's board games or card games or you know, backup power supplies to keep your tablets running, what, whatever, it, whatever that is for you and your family, it should absolutely be considered. Uno could cause some fights though. <laughs> Uno, man, the best game of all time. I played Uno last week with my family. <laughs> That's great. We've been playing uh, a lot of apples to apples. And then I just bought, like before this whole thing went down, I bought Exploding Kittens, which <laughs> I heard a lot about. We haven't played it yet. It's a card game. Okay. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's another that's another part is the, the, the psychological component that people often overlooked when it comes to survival stuff. That's an important part of, of, of prepping and knowing how you're going to be mentally resilient during this time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we live in a really unique day and age where you can hop on FaceTime. You know, we were on, you know, FaceTime last night with my parents, you know, what if that stuff wasn't available? You couldn't talk to anybody. You couldn't have FaceTime with anybody. You couldn't get on the phone. I mean, it's all totally possible. It goes back to the beginning of this conversation that we're having, where if one of these other services that we really depend on gets knocked off grid. I mean, we're having an entirely different conversation here. You know, I mean, in general, on the scale of what could happen, you know, this whole coronavirus pandemic, you know, there are there are some really incredible lessons to be learned with this as far as, you know, how can I be better prepared for something where one of these critical services is knocked offline. And I think this is a really great time to pull out a journal and start writing some of this stuff down and, you know, thinking about what are the lessons that I'm learning right here and over the course of the next couple of weeks that I need to fix and put into place for the next event that not might happen, but absolutely will. It, it, we will have other events like this and worse. So you know, another a part in the article that you wrote about uh, bugging in for us is self-defense. Right now with the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, first responders are still there, police are there, but there might be a situation where their hands are going to be tied up. There's not going to be police officers there to, to respond to you if you need help. So what should people think about when it comes to self-defense in a bug-in situation? Yeah, that's like a really great question. You know, those for I have a lot of friends and and family members who are first responders, whether it's police or or paramedics or firefighters, and they'll be the first to tell you that in that their all of their services are all planned and organized for a normal day. And when things get not normal, then they become understaffed and overwhelmed. And it's just a part of, you know, every single disaster or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, that happens. You know, it is an issue. First responders are a little less responsive during times of chaos. And so one should always be prepared in a worst case scenario to fortify and defend their home. Whether that's just, you know, simple barricading measures. You know, one of the one of the best door barricades that that I've ever seen is there are these little there are these little brackets that you can screw on the inside of your door up against your door jam and you can just drop a two by four into those brackets behind your door. And I tell you what, with one of those in place, no one's getting in your home. 
you know, unless they're coming through a window. I mean, and if they're getting into your home, they're making a huge racket doing it. And it's a really simple way. I mean, it's such a simple, it's like a, it's like $2 brackets and a four foot section of two by four. And it makes one of the most effective door barricades in the world. I hate even talking about stuff like this because it seems, you know, it seems so ridiculous, but at the same time, I mean, you know, it's all stuff that's totally possible. And then, you know, as far as home defense goes, you know, uh, the obvious home defense tool is going to be firearms. And before that, firearms training. And so, you know, I'm a huge proponent of firearms uh, re- that are used responsibly and firearms training. I'd say that, you know, if you're not willing to invest time in firearms training, then I wouldn't even bother investing in a firearm. But, you know, in, in a worst case scenario, you're not going to find a better way to defend your home and your family than a firearm. As uh, Woodrow Call said in Lonesome Dove, better to have it than not need it, than need it than not have it. Boy, that's the story of my life right there. But, you know, if I didn't choose the motto, it's not if, but when, I probably should have chosen that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's talk let's this. We've talked about a lot of great stuff, water storage, food storage, first aid, getting the training you need, uh, also considering the psychological, your psychological welfare and well-being during a, a bug-in situation. What do you think people can start doing now in the current shelter in place and social distancing orders that we have right now to brace themselves for this current thing we're dealing with, but also get them ready for the next one? Well, I think the most important thing to do right now is to is to sit down and start taking some notes about what you're observing about what's happening right now because it's going to be really easy. This whole corona thing is going to is this thing is going to end in a few weeks and we're going to all try our quickest and best to get back to normal as quickly as humanly possible every single one of us. And when we get back to normal or whatever our new normal will be, this this whole thing is going to be really easy to forget and and we're going to intentionally try to forget it. And because of that, I would highly encourage everyone, like I emailed my own list, my own email list last week saying, listen, right now is the time to take some notes and to really think about the lessons that we're learning in the midst of this whole thing. What, what are my weaknesses? You know, what, what are the things I'm lacking on in food? What am I struggling with right now being stuck inside? And what do I need to fix? You know, really taking notes and starting a journal and putting to start putting some, some things on paper that you can take action on when this whole thing blows over. Because it's really, I mean, it's only a matter of time before something on this scale or worse. And, and there are many, many things that could be worse than this is going to happen. And the time, you know, the time to, the, to take care of that stuff, this is, this is one of the biggest wake up calls I've ever seen when it comes to disaster preparedness. I've never seen something like this as far as a wake up call goes. In general, people, all of their needs are being met and it's a perfect opportunity to sit back and reflect on how well am I prepared if something worse happens. And so as far as action steps go, I would say the best thing to do right now is write down notes on things that you're experiencing right now so that you can fix those moving forward. Awesome. Well, Creek, where can people go to learn more about your work? Uh, To learn more about me, uh, the best place to go is my website. It's at creekstewart.com. And if you're just getting starting with disaster preparedness and survival and you want a really great little step into that world, I'm running a free course right now um, that you can sign up for on my website. It's a Build the Bug Out Bag Challenge, and it's a free five-day course where I walk you through five days of free training to build your bug out bag. And it's entirely free. It'd be a perfect project to take on while you're at home. And it's not about spending money. It's about gathering things around your house and putting them into a bag. So if you don't have a bug out bag, this would be a fantastic first step. And it's very manageable. Well, Creek, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, man. It's, it's always an honor and a pleasure for me, Brett. I appreciate you. My guest today was Creek Stewart. He's a survival expert. The guy's written lots of books. You can find them all on Amazon and you can check out more about his work at his website, creekstewart.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash bugin where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.